Hello and welcome to this video on what happens with your plasma donation and all the uh, good things that come from it. A plasma donation is a common alternative to blood donations. Instead of taking all of your blood, the donation center instead takes out your blood, separates the red blood cells and generally platelets, and returns these to your body. This leaves behind a plasma or the liquid part of your blood for the purposes of transfusions. This might seem like a relatively useless product at first, it's mostly made up of water, but depending on your blood type, this can in fact be the most useful donation you can make. Your blood is made up of about 55% plasma, 41% red blood cells, and 1% platelets. There's a small amount of various other components in there as well. The 55% plasma is made up of many proteins, obviously a lot of water, and immunological products such as antibodies. Among the many proteins in plasma, there are albumins. These are a protein made in the liver, and they act as a, a carrier or a vessel for things in blood. Some of these are for lipids, so they are miscible with water, since lipids are a fat or oil and therefore otherwise not miscible, and others are there to clean up waste from metabolism, and make it more readily transportable out of things like the urinary system. The other role is things like serum albumin, and this creates a pressure gradient. This gradient keeps water in the blood vessels, a phenomenon called oncotic pressure. Finally, we have globulins. Globulins are split into three groups, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha globulins are largely focused on inhibiting proteases or enzymes that break down proteins, transporting hormones and being hormones in their own right in some cases. Beta globulins are similar to alpha globulins and they perform many of the same roles. Gamma globulins are mostly the category that covers antibodies. It is important to note not all gamma globulins are antibodies and not all antibodies are gamma globulins. These three broad parts of plasma are then processed in a variety of ways to create blood products or more accurately plasma products for use. The other reason plasma is useful is that Unlike red blood cells or whole blood, a plasma can be frozen and stored for a much longer time. In fact, a fresh frozen plasma, or plasma that's been frozen within 6 to 18 hours after collection, it can be kept for 12 months. Further, the plasma and parts of plasma do not need to account for the rhesus type of recipients, which is an advantage over regular blood transfusions. This is also why many blood services choose to ask donors to donate plasma in lieu of blood, if the individual's blood type is other than O negative, as O negative is the universal blood donation. The first kind you have is a clinical fresh frozen plasma. This is fundamentally what comes out of your body, it's just been refined slightly, and then rather obviously given its name, frozen and defrosted. What you get with a fresh frozen plasma is a part of one donation that's been made, and it's collected either as whole blood, or as what is called the apheresis, or the plasma that's been collected by the donation center when you've been donating. You find this especially useful, let's say, if someone has issues around coagulation, for example, if they're at risk of bleeding, or if, for example, they are not responding to vitamin K as the way intended, or other similar factors, or in worst case scenario, if these factors are just not available at all. Other times it's used when uh, individuals need the clotting factors or other plasma coagulation factors. They have, well, most likely in the midst of actually, the uh, cardiac bypass surgery, have liver disease, and so on. There are many different clinical reasons why fresh frozen plasma may be used. The fresh frozen plasma itself may actually be uh, processed and it results in two products. One is called cryodepleted plasma, and one is called cryoprecipitate. First of all, we have cryodepleted plasma, and what this is is the supernatant, or the uh, solids, remaining after cryoprecipitate has been removed from whole blood or from fresh frozen plasma. Generally speaking, we're talking about fresh frozen plasma, as that's what's typically used to produce it. We say typically, as you can make fresh frozen plasma from whole blood, or process whole blood to create it, but more on that later. Cryodepleted plasma is generally used when somebody has thrombotic thritocytopenia purpura. 
it can also be an alternative for things like coagulopathies. Importantly, they're used for coagulopathies where you don't want to reduce the amount as factor 8 for Brindigen or factor 13. There's also von Willebrand's factor to consider. It can also be used as a temporary way to counteract warfarin in patients who have had either surgery or warfarin overdose. As mentioned, the other side to this is the cryoprecipitate, and this is done by taking a, either whole blood or frozen fresh plasma, and when you thaw it, you get a precipitate. This is the part of it that can't be frozen. It's cold and soluble, and so it separates out from the rest of the plasma. This is used particularly for fibrogenogen deficiency or similar issues around where you lack the necessary fibrogenogen active compounds. And mostly we're talking here about things like trauma. Think of a car crash or similar. It is generally rich, or at least significantly more rich for its volume in the clotting factors like factor 8C, fibrogenogen, and von Willebrand factor. Now we come to the uh, proteins, let's say, that are make up the bulk of plasma. Albumin specifically, although to be clear, it's generally described as human albumin solely because albumin is present in many species that have well, red blood cells like the rest of us, and therefore they need to have the same considerations. It's generally used for things like shock, hyperalbuminemia, plasmapheresis, and cardiothoracic surgery. As mentioned, the primary reason why it's used is that it provides a pressure or a force that keeps the blood, or at least the liquid from blood, inside the blood vessels, preventing it from trying to overwhelm or draw out fluid from the rest of the body, causing systemic damage. A particularly useful phenomena if we're talking about, say, burn injuries, where, due to the large amount of tissue damage from burns and the consequential inflammation, there's a lot more porosity to the capillaries, and that allows for the water within the capillaries to exit out and move into local tissue. And this can cause issues particularly around things like swelling. The uh, last major component we've already mentioned is the role of immunoglobulins, or essentially the antibodies from the immune system. Now, the different kinds of antibodies can be used in different ways. For example, the first application for it is going to be simply as intravenous immunoglobulin. This is just the portion of the plasma that has, generally speaking, IgG in it that's made up from multiple different plasma donations, essentially a concentrated mix of many different antibodies from many different donors that provide a degree of blanket protection. Now, this blanket protection isn't perfect, but it is a significant improvement over nothing at all. And if individuals who have, let's say, donated, have been exposed to particular antigens, they'll have a higher concentration of antibodies to that antigen. This will allow you to, uh, let's say, uh, temporarily buff the ability of the immune system to not only detect, but then respond to specific pathogens, or antigens in particular, that you want to deal with. For example, a common candidate, or let's say target, is cytomegalovirus. The immunoglobulins from this are commonly given, particularly if there's concerns about infection in bone marrow, renal or cardiac issues, for recipients of transplants especially if those transplant recipients are antibody negative. The body simply doesn't know what it's dealing with and needs time, and by virtue of this, that time is given to develop that immunological response. Hepatitis B is another candidate, and generally speaking, it's given for those who have not received prior vaccination, the vaccination program's incomplete, or who by virtue of simply not being able to respond to the vaccine, can't be protected. And the last is the uh, rhesus, or D antigen. The D antigen, or rhesus antigen, has a immunoglobulin, or an antibody, that will correspond to it. And when the two bind, it will effectively cancel it out. For most people, this isn't a consideration. It's not particularly important. But if a mother is rhesus negative, and a child is rhesus positive, it is very important. That's because 
if this situation occurs, you get hemolytic disease of the newborn, or in other words, the immune system attacks the developing fetus and will, for all intents and purposes, kill it. And by giving them this antibody, they can temporarily mask the developing fetus from the mother's immune system, thereby preventing the uh, rather obvious and negative consequences of having an immune response to developing fetuses. We've mentioned the next thing already, and that has to do with factors. Factors, for example, are related to the coagulation cascade needed for blood to clot. There are different, let's say, formulations out there. Some try and increase the amount of factor 8 or von Willebrand's factor, others look at factor 9, and so on and so forth. The various different, let's call them formulations, will be used in different ways. For example, some people have congenital defects that prevent their body from making certain kinds of factors. By providing them with this, for example those with haemophilia type B, they can otherwise live a normal life. They don't need to worry about it, but they don't need all of the content from a plasma donation. On the other hand, you might have what is effectively the opposite problem. That is, that your body tries to clot too readily. And so, by having what you could describe as a prophylactic treatment, you can prevent them from having unintended and certainly unwanted reactions during things like surgery. Of course, beyond all of these individual parts of plasma, well, this plasma as a whole, it can be used more or less as is. As mentioned, you have what is effectively a fresh frozen plasma, plasma that's being collected, stored, and the supernatant removed, leaving behind most of the plasma otherwise intact, and this can be transfused similar to whole blood. However, where whole blood volume is needed, but not the red blood cells, it is particularly useful, especially since, well, red blood cells or whole blood it tends to have a much shorter shelf life and therefore it should be husbanded where possible. Because you don't need to worry about the red blood cells, you don't need to worry about the rhesus factor as well, which is another major factor in its preference. It's one less variable, let's say, that could lead to adverse events. This is particularly why, if you're looking at something that will compensate for a sudden drop in blood pressure, but without any obvious hemorrhage, a plasma is good, and for other uses as well, where you don't want to have red blood cells necessarily. The alternative to this, of course, is, say, saline, but saline with various additives for the right oncotic pressure. The role of plasma is more than just to make up blood volume, to be clear about that. It can be an important part of treating infections, immunological complications of pregnancy, infections, clotting problems, and more. It's just that that's one element of a relatively effective, very versatile, and fairly simple to obtain product, as unlike a whole blood, plasma can be donated roughly every two weeks, considerably more than what blood is, which can only be done roughly once every three months. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.